for, for plebs, by plebs, dropping the Bitcoin only signal. Pleb underground. Welcome everyone to the Pleb Underground. Welcome back to Pleb Underground. This is episode 110. Pleb on the ground. We're back with a speller. Peer to peer peers, no automated teller. They say I'm a machine built in AV yellow. Only she gets the beats. For you, it's a cappella. Sometimes I write for my taps. Preference type for thy gaps. Don't care for you. Don't write for thy claps. Not high profile, so don't fight off like paps. I can never be Drake. Can't write emotionless. I can never be fake. Can't fight emotion cause. I can never just flake. Can't write the motioners. I cause forever leg quake. True might devotion cause. Each week I'm now tasked with maturing one cast. It's alluring. Sunshine bast. Upset holes recurring. Few unsigned and masked. I'm quick with words, so I'll leave writing last minute. New trick with birds, always fighting fast in it. Two wit code words, no exciting, past bin it. You were in her DMs, but I taught her, King Pin it. I'll plant this short and sweet phloem. I'm Walton, here's your weekly poem. Privacy folk, perhaps you know him. We're graced today by the one J9 Rowan. Walton, absolutely awesome rhyme. <sighs> Guys, welcome back to another weekly episode of pleb underground and joining us today we've got fellow i am going to say a fellow bitcoiner and privacy researcher and investigative journalist janine janine thank you very much for joining us on the pleb underground it is absolutely awesome to have you on the show i was a huge fan of block digest and we're going to uh we're going to introduce, maybe reintroduce you to the newer Bitcoiners that aren't aware of this awesome show that uh, that you did once upon a time. But I know you do a lot of other awesome stuff. It's great to have you on. Yeah, thank you for having me. We are going to move it on over to the numbers. Yeah, the numbers, of course, brought to us by Time Chain Stats and Time Chain Calendar. What do the numbers look like this week, Phil? At the time of this recording, the block height is 868,432. The Bitcoin fiat exchange, 69,931. It'll change. Yeah, there you go. Anyways. All right. Big max per BTC, 13,577. So it's actually moving pretty uh, pretty quick. Crazy day. Anyways, uh, total public lightning capacity, 5,239 BTC. That's right. Lightning still not dead. Every week we're going to say that. Every week we're going to remind everyone and they're going to cry harder. Lightning just isn't dead. Anyways. Ah, fastest fee, nine sats per V-byte. Moscow time, 14.30. Boom. Those are the numbers. Those are the numbers. It's kind of interesting. Um, we uh, we went over uh, 70K uh, this week, and uh, people were happy. Uh, a lot of newer Bitcoin enjoyers were, were very happy. And then less than 24, maybe less than 48 hours later, they were extremely unhappy to be at that same price. It uh, it's very weird. It's uh, it's very weird. Anyways, Walton, last week uh, we missed you. You're a tab conf. Yeah, um, I was doing numbers. That, yeah, uh, I I helped them sell like all their merch, like which was like three and a half million sats of of merch. Um, nice. I, and I bumped the prices to meme numbers. And then and then they donated some money to like a side event. So like it was just, it, like everyone's winning. Like um, yeah, working on working on numbers. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to it in the in the rec section. Okay. Um, but the, like the numbers of uh merch opportunities of you know merch collection opportunities at this conference were just just insane. Um, you know, on top of obviously the you know the great uh, hackathon uh, prizes and. Uh, other 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 building uh, that that happened amongst real developers but you know like uh, those of us that aren't developers uh, have have various side quests at, at conferences but we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit ah oh, very interesting very interesting janine were you a tabconf am i the only one of the uh, the three that was not there i i was there in spirit <laughs> ah like me there in spirit well, because shinobi was there so I guess I was there too, it's weird, because, because you were there. Wasn't there. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, let's take a look at the numbers articles. Here we go, Walton. Um, this was this was your donation. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm excited for yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. me about this. So Mononautical, right, we so we love these insights. Basically, what happened was is Casey, Casey and Erin. You know, Casey of Ordinals, uh, the, the grandfather of Ordinals, Casey. Rod Armour and uh, uh, 
uh, Aaron and his friend. Uh, they have a podcast called Hell Money Podcast. And I believe they got rugged on like Patreon. And so what does Casey do? Casey, Casey launches a, a shit coin, I believe. Uh, and this is to like, you know, to, to you know, to, to get some money. Um, but then also, of course, in true Casey fashion says, this is worthless. Don't buy it. But people still buy it. And he makes a bunch of money. Um, so uh, I guess well done, Casey. But I, 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 I like, I'm a numbers guy and I like animations and mononaut did a cool little time lapse of like how the fees changed over this this time period of this um little mint of uh where it went from five to uh, uh about a thousand sats per v byte and back again in the span of an hour yeah this is uh um, this is very and people cool. go oh why why should people you know share this kind of data why should you sh why should you share shitcoin data well I don't know. I quite like knowing maybe when there's some sort of like spike in fees or what the reason for a spike in fees might be over a short time period, because then, you know, oh, maybe it's just going to be for a short time period because it's just for this mint and like, you know, tomorrow mm. is going to be good or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Janine, I'm, I'm very curious as to what your thoughts are on this type of stuff on Bitcoin. I mean, I probably should save it for the fireside chat when, when we dive into everything Janine. Um, but I, I am very curious what, what your thoughts are on this. Because back in back in 2021, or even a little bit earlier, when I was listening to, uh, to Block Digest, I, um, yeah, obviously, the landscape was very different. In terms of fees? <laughs> uh, just in terms of just in terms of this, uh, Again, uh, subjective spam, right? This this type of quote unquote financial activity on Bitcoin, right? The the runes or whatever these are. What are they? Yeah. Even. Uh, honestly, these days I don't know. Um, I've been through so much of this stuff. Like this is like I don't know the third or fourth round of like someone does something creative but also very high fee uh on bitcoin and then after a few years it changes into something else um i don't know i like personally for me like my use case is very monetary um so personally i don't have much interest in the other use cases and i mean i am very con I, so the anecdote i can give is there was a project um on the ethereum blockchain many years ago, I think this was 2018, and I can't even remember the name of it, um, but it was a project where they tried to do journalism on the Ethereum blockchain by basically just publishing articles, entire articles, all of the metadata into the Ethereum blockchain as like censorship resistant journalism. And I thought this was a terrible idea. Like it was, there are ways to use blockchains like Ethereum or Bitcoin or any other thing that is much more like efficient than that. And you get the same benefits um like the open timestamps project was doing like the good necessary work many years before that and that was actually effective and it did not cause you know it wasn't an inefficient use of block space um so i prefer things like that um i think people who just you know shoves things into the blockchain i don't know i've never been a big fan of that i think there's more efficient ways of doing that and that's just from my position of like I appreciate the, the monetary use cases consent. and I'm a journalist and I like being efficient. Um, and surprisingly, unsurprisingly, that project did not last very long, um, even though it was basically funded by consensus, like through the roof, millions and millions of dollars wasted um, to build that. And yeah. <laughs> I was not aware of that one. Um, people are just shoving anything into the blockchain. Um, who, who, who are we to decide what should or shouldn't be put into the blockchain? Um, maybe there are things that we don't like being put on the blockchain, but if if we're kind of pro censorship, then it kind of comes around to bite you in the end, right? Like it's, um, yeah. How do you how do you judge what should or shouldn't be put into the blockchain, um, or rather should should then you know changes be made such that. Uh, to prevent these kind of things. Yeah, I mean, I'm so I'm not to be clear, I'm not in favor of necessarily changing the system to censor certain types of content being added to the blockchain, even if I think it's a stupid use case, like I would never say, oh, yeah. well, we just need to censor these things or like, I, I'm very much like part of the reason I like Bitcoin is the permissionlessness of using it. And 
what we have is what is. And so I don't agree with censoring anything, but I can still have opinions about maybe that was not a good, you know, I can have opinion. People do a lot of things that I disagree with and think are stupid, but I would never say they shouldn't be allowed to say that, that or publish that. Let the left curvers pay the fees is, is your view. Yeah, I mean, let let the ecosystem figure it out by pricing it in somehow. And like, yes, there are consequences that does affect other people besides the people that are doing that type of work. Um, and that's unfortunate. But like, I think that's a lesser risk than trying to introduce censorship mechanisms, because I've, I'm very familiar with the results of uh, censorship mechanisms in other areas of my work. Um, and so I'm generally not in favor of censorship. So to, to me, where some of this comes from is the, the, the concept in economics that individuals are rational economic actors. And I don't believe that that's true um, in terms of that they always do what's right for them on an economic basis. Um, I, I I think like actually what a free market is, is um, a market in which individuals are free to spend their money on whatever nonsense they, they want. And, that, and that's what we, you know, that's what we see in, in and on Bitcoin. Mm. Yeah. I'm generally like, yeah, you can spend your money how you like, and I can still call you stupid for doing that, but I won't try to stop you. <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, we're going to take a look at our next numbers article because you were talking about uh, rational actors and whatnot. So here we go. This is kind of it's kind of a weird tweet, right? Uh, this is a retweet from uh, from Ropium, right? The fellow Bitcoiner and memer. Uh, new Bitcoin price target unlocked. That's right. For the people who think that Bitcoin can't go up forever. Uh, yeah, that's right. This I, I think a lot of people are talking about this this week, right? Russian court finds Google 20 decillion dollars. 20 decillion. And for some reason, I saw somebody post, uh, this is what comes after um, a trillion. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's, it's a few more sets of zeros than that. That's definitely a few more sets of zeros. Wait, are you just rejecting anything coming beyond trillion? Because I kind of like respect that stance, Phil. Like, no, 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 I'm not rejecting no, anything nothing beyond. beyond trillion. Once once it gets beyond trillion, like you just no decillion. more money. Decillion is way more than that, though. I'm just saying it's not the next it's thing that comes after more. trillion. It's, it's got to be like quadrillion, right? Like it's like tr tr trillion references three. Yeah. The fact that there are like three sets of three zeros. Yep. Um, I think it goes to quad quadrillion maybe next. Decillion is 10 sets of zeros, right? Pro pro 10 sets of threes. Zeros, so it's like yeah. It's... 10, to the, 10 to the 30 or something, yeah um anyway dude who's who's sitting there thinking that the printer isn't going to go on for infinity if they if some type if some type of a court just ruled this it's nuts anyways i just thought it was a perfect numbers article because it, it just outlines where the fiat system is going right that number doesn't even exist yet and yet now it does yeah i don't know i mean i feel like at some point the number of shit coins are going to overtake it right at some point <laughs> somehow but but somehow it's like, they're on their how way. Many, how many hours of like YouTube are there like to watch glo like total? There's just, there's a lot of just like stuff that gets like made. Um, 2.4 million shitcoins right now, supposedly. That's the approximate number. Right, but it, wasn't it like 20,000 and then like all this like stuff on Solana started happening? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Anyways, yeah, there you go. 20 decillion. Guys, that's going to do it. For no, no, the... one second. One no? more thing. One more thing. I okay. guess it's like a segue into Janine, but where does the J9 come from? I, I know where it comes from because, like, the word nine just then it's just Janine, but like, people aren't going to see um, that on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> They're not going to see that. Yeah. <laughs> They're not going to see that. But no. why not? Janine, what, what's the J9? <laughs> um, I mean, so J9 is so sort of like how decentralization can, I've seen it represented as D10. I think it has to do with the number of characters or something, but like, that's like, I don't know, there's some kind of system where you can, there's certain words that have been like given codes, like a number uh, or a letter and then a number. Um, and so J9 is just the way you can represent my name. Very nice. <laughs> and someone, someone gave it to me a long time ago. <laughs> a lot of symbolism, a lot of deepness and symbolism. Very nice. All right, guys, it's going to wrap it up for the numbers. We're going to move it on over to 
the Fireside Chat. Let's get cozy. The Pleb Underground is brought to you by Thunder Funder. Check it out, thunderfunder.com. Thunder Funder is a funding portal registered with the SEC and a member of FINRA. Their mission is to provide retail investors access to investments while supporting the growth of open source projects. They love Bitcoin. Check out their shit coins. That's thunderfunder.com. Welcome back, everyone. Fireside chat. As you know, Janine is joining us. Janine? So um, my introduction to you was always on Block Digest. I did not know that you were a privacy res a researcher or an investigative uh, journalist. So I think for me Dude, anyways. Who, who's, yeah? So like they, they did, Janine did it with Shinobi, right? And like, yeah. who, and who the other you dude. know is like more into privacy than Shinobi? It's someone that maybe you didn't even, weren't even paying attention to because they don't talk as loudly. So like it makes sense that Janine's kind of, you know, Anyway, I'll let Janine talk for herself. But Janine, tell us about how you know everything about privacy, kind of. Um, so yes, uh, I did uh, the Block Digest podcast um, between, uh, I think we started actually right around the time that Segway was getting activated, August 2017. Um, I, was, I was barely involved at that point, but eventually I became more involved. So 2017 to 2021. Um, our schedule changed a lot in those years. Like there was a time, I think we were almost doing it not maybe every day. I don't even know. We changed our schedule a lot just based on when people were available. But at one point, I think it was like every day or twice a week, then once a week. Um, and then eventually kind of petered out in 2021, even 2020 really, um, just because people's lives were changing and um, they just, you know, people didn't have time um, as much anymore. Um, thankfully, um, coincidentally, we actually just planned to have a reunion episode this month. So uh, if you are one of the people who has been badgering us, um, very appreciative of that though. Uh, if you've been badgering us for the last couple of years about when we're coming back and why we left, then you will get to hear from us in about two weeks or so. Very nice, very nice. I'm definitely excited. Pleb Underground uh, will definitely be uh, retweeting that and uh, helping to uh, to get to get people to uh, tune in because I think it's very important. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about investigative journalism? I'm I'm very curious uh, because you were talking a little bit before uh, about censorship. So maybe could you clue us in a little bit on on what you do Phil, in that? Just be yeah. before we pivot before hmm. we pivot to that i maybe maybe janine could just speak on what what's it like um working long term with um um a character like shinobi cuz um we uh. we've been friends with him for a while and um he's he's an entertaining uh, walter's just going to drag us into um, the mud no no this is this is what people want to know about like what's it <laughs> so, like working nobody wants with, to know uh, what you, you know, do janine they want to know about this <laughs> What's what's it like working with Shinobi? How, uh, uh, what what are what are the highlights? The highlights. Um, I mean, if you want the highlights, you can actually go and listen to our podcast um, <laughs> because we recorded Excellent. many many hours of it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So the the so with Block Digest, I mean, we had a few people come in and out over the years. The main three were me, Shinobi, and Rick. Um, and basically, Block Digest is how I think I met Shinobi um, in the first place. And um, yeah, I mean, the three of us got to know each other, I would say, at least intellectually and principally um, pretty well over those years because we were often talking to each other for <laughs> multiple hours every week <laughs> for a few years. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it wasn't even really planned. Like we didn't, I mean, I don't want to get into that, but basically the reason Block Digest started is because I used to be on another channel, I'll call it, um, and needed another home. I became pod less and then joined another pod. And um, yeah, I just, it turns out I had things to say. And so I became a co-host. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I really enjoyed it. I mean, I can use it now as a record of, we went through so much news and I've gone back a few times to like look at our older episodes and kind of been like, oh, I don't even remember talking about that. 
Um, Isn't it crazy? Yeah, we just went through so much stuff. Um, and yeah, I I mean, I really enjoyed it. Like I, I enjoyed doing those episodes. Um, and we, uh, I think at first we were recording directly through YouTube and then we went to Mumble. And I think, I don't know how long we did that, but definitely till the, till the end, we were using mostly Mumble. Um, and yeah, we had like a core group of people that would listen live in the Mumble. And then we started publishing also off of YouTube. So people didn't have to, um, watch us, although there wasn't much to see because usually I think Rick was the only person who ever had his camera on. <laughs> um, so it was mostly static images, but Rick made a bunch of like really amazing art. Um, if you go back and look at our episodes now and you see the intro, um, we eventually did get an intro, got a little bit more professional. Um, but if you look at the art now, um, a lot of the companies that he put into this kind of cyberpunk dystopian, um, theme that we had, like they don't exist anymore or they've changed names. And so that's a bit nostalgic, um, to look at that now, but yeah, Rick made some really great art and um shinobi out of the three of us was definitely the most um technically knowledgeable about a lot of the topics that we um discussed he could go to a great level of depth and um so it's no surprise to me that he became you know a technical editor at bitcoin magazine recently this is this is why years. i pointed him to my bitcoin council of autism he was he was fantastic in those the late 2021 2022 uh years on on twitter space that i did actually reach out to him just a couple of moments ago to see if he fancied joining our conversation uh but uh as as you note that he is the the technical editor of bitcoin magazine he's actually declined our office our offer despite saying hello janine uh because apparently he has to finish a piece for the print magazine so uh hmm. how yeah how how hmm. apt that you that you mentioned his uh recent uh position yeah, so um, again, I just really enjoyed doing the podcast and I, I mean, I'm glad to say that I think um, over, you know, across the, all the years that we were doing it, like we all ended up generally in a, a better place um, <laughs> than when we started. So, yeah. You were mentioning another podcast and I'm, I'm curious, what are you, can you share the name of the show? I would I, prefer maybe not I missed to. Okay, you prefer not to? Okay. It, it, it wasn't BitBoy's show, right? Like you weren't on. No, I would. I don't think I would ever. <laughs> I don't I don't even know what that is, but that doesn't okay, sound good. like one I would want to be on. <laughs> I'm a girl. <laughs> I'm a bit girl. <laughs> I'm a bit girl. That's awesome. Oh, God. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, we're going to switch from the stuff that everybody wants to hear to the stuff that nobody wants to hear, apparently. But I'd like to talk about the investigative journalism aspect. Um if uh, if you can if you can share a little bit have i mean we were talking about censorship before is that something that you yourself have run into with pieces that you've worked on um has that happened or is that just something like generally right like you're you know you know how some people have to unfortunately experience something to realize that they are not an advocate of it right whereas other people just inherently think about something and are like, no, you know, like because of this, this and this, like, was it something that happened to you or is this just something generally right? Like a bunch of, you know, um, yeah. Thoughts? So just to generally start off, like, I mean, cause some people might hear like, oh, I do privacy research and I'm a journalist. Those are kind of opposite, like completely opposite careers in many ways, because like the role of a privacy researcher is generally to help people improve their privacy and the role of a journalist is to often if you know you're not ethical break people's privacy um or and just to so, draw more attention to them I like yeah like the the whole point is you're drawing more attention to something that you think people should pay attention to and privacy for the most part has the complete opposite goal and so the only way i can really justify that is like i mean i do have i do have principles i wouldn't use any of the skills I have to violate someone's privacy, um, uh, at least if they didn't deserve it. Um, <laughs> and, but because I have like those two 
different modes of work, like they actually benefit each other because when I'm doing privacy work, I actually think, you know, if I was a journalist and let's say I wanted to go after this person, this person who is, you know, asking for my help or something, um, how would I do that? And then I include that kind of perspective in my recommendations of like, here's how to protect yourself against someone who is doing that or how someone might find you if they were doing that kind of work. And then when I'm a journalist, I'm thinking of, you know, if people aren't doing these things to protect information about them, or, and this could be a person, this could be a company, a government, what have you, um, what are ways that I can find information about them that normally I would, you know, if I was advising them on how to improve their privacy, that like this, this is what I would say you would protect and most people don't. So I'm always kind of thinking at it thinking about it from those different perspectives um, mm -hmm. and they kind of build on each other. Um, I mean, I think the, for me, like the interest in privacy was, I feel like that's more the, like I've been interested in that longer and it was more instinctual than the journalism part. I mean, mm -hmm. I had, I did want to be a journalist from very early on because um, just writing is one of my core skills. I do a lot of it. Um, and especially like investigating how the world works in general and being very curious. Um, but the privacy part was more instinctual just because I can't really remember a time where I had to be taught or it had to be explained to me like why I should care about it or why I should value it. I just kind of always did. Um, there was a period in my life where I actually would have considered myself a technophobe because before I learned how to be safe on the internet and how to use it uh, in a safe way. I was terrified of like, of people being able to use tools like that against me, or if I use them improperly disclosing the wrong kind of information. And so my initial impulse was like, I don't, I don't want to be near this thing. Just keep it away from me. So I was, <laughs> I was, I, I was very close to being, um, there was a time where I considered like being Amish. Um, then I found out about the religious aspect and I lost interest. <laughs> but I one like thing I- is that like Amish 2.0 a little bit sometimes. Yeah, so so something I do want to point out about the Amish that I really appreciate and a lot of like the Amish kind of inspired or adjacent communities is that they, they're, they're actually not technophobes and they're not Luddites. They actually have a very considerate adoption strategy for technology where they make it like a community discussion of, you know, this new technology exists, should we adopt it or not? And what is the impact of that technology on our society? And, you know, you can debate about whether they made the right decision or not, but I actually really like that they're so thoughtful about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the result is that, you know, they go around on horse carts. Um, they do have some technology, but like they, their adoption of technology is extremely slow. And so the reason their lifestyle looks the way it does is just because they actually consider like, what is the impact of all of this technology on our lives, on our community, and should we adopt it or not? And so I actually like, I, I, I like the, the consideration that they have for that. And so I, I mean, that's, I'm definitely not nearly as extreme as that um, in my own life, but I do appreciate that perspective and way of approaching technology because I think not enough people do that. Um, there are a lot of people, they just hear about a new thing, they start using it and they, they like a zombie, they just don't, they don't consider like, how is this impacting my life and what effect is it having on me? What effect is it having on my family and my mm -hmm. society? And yeah. Yeah. Much less thoughtfulness. I, I completely agree. Um, and that, that's a really good point about the, uh, about the Amish. I think that, uh, I think that's kind of a win, right, for uh, for small communities. Um, I don't know how applicable. I, I don't know how well that would work in like you know major metropolitan cities and stuff like that, right, where you're dealing with like millions of people, you know, everybody chiming in. But it, it definitely seems to work on the local level, and maybe that's kind of more of those conversations that people need to have. So. Um, yeah, yeah. City. I mean, cities by design have you're dealing with more people, you're dealing with people in close quarters. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the pace of the pace of innovation, the pace of change um, is extremely fast. And like, there are some benefits to that too. Like you just explore a lot of things quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but 
then the side effect of that is, um, I mean, there's there's a really great book that I read um, a couple of years ago, um, Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, and the the general idea of that is like we haven't really spent enough time thinking about like how humans evolved to do certain things to live certain ways and how modern living is often in conflict with that not that everything is bad necessarily there's a lot of benefits to modern life um but there are some downsides that we aren't often even aware of and we're not we're not really aware of how everything that we've evolved to be and live for is often in conflict with that would you argue that bitcoin aligns with the hunter gatherer thing because surely um if you're not storing your wealth in something that's in one place like a, your primary residence that that enables the 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 more nomadic lifestyle of a hunter gatherer yeah um i mean so uh... So it does fit. So uh, I mean, this is how I can talk about how I got into Bitcoin. But like the initial appeal for me for with Bitcoin, because I'm in otherwise I'm a very like cash based person. I really love cash. I use cash as much as possible. And when I was a kid, like I saved my money in cash. And when I became old enough to you know get my first bank account and deposit money, um, the idea of giving a complete stranger whose name I didn't even know my money <laughs> and like having a little, you know, digital number saying I have this much money. Like it didn't really appeal to me because mm -hmm. I thought, well, I have the cash in my hand. I can use that. I don't really have a need to like do online shopping because I can just go to the store right now. So why do I need this thing? And um, actually it was a terrible introduction because I got like a debit card and then I tried to use the debit card at the grocery store right after I got it and it failed, it did not work. And I still remember that anxiety of like, I just gave strangers my money, this card is not working, what the hell? Um, <laughs> like I had this anxiety of like my, my this thing that I, I saved up money as a kid and now that money may be gone, like what happened? And I go back to the bank and they had to, oh, it's a new, yeah, this happens with new cards because it hasn't been used before. It's like, yeah, whatever. Um, so the appeal, the appeal to me with Bitcoin was like, even though it's digital, it's something that I control. Like it's something that like I make decisions about where it goes. Um, as long as I have good privacy and security practices, like it's, it's mine, it's safe. Like nobody tells me what to do with it. Um, and there's just so many benefits in, especially in the, in the digital world for that compared to the bank account system, the app, the app bank account system these days, um, where like, yes, it's digital numbers, but like the 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 level of sovereignty you have with something you actually control versus something that could theoretically be taken away by that company that service provider your state at some point for a number of different reasons like that it, like i saw that that was what i saw at the beginning and that's why it appealed to me and um what especially drew my interest to that use case was you know julian assange and wikileaks my first real introduction i would say to bitcoin yes my first real introduction to bitcoin as something that like actually had a use case was the cypherpunks show um and you can still find it there's a youtube channel called journeyman pictures i think they were the distributor for the show um the cypherpunk show and then that got turned into a book um cypherpunks freedom and the future of the internet um and they talked about using Bitcoin and the benefits of Bitcoin. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. So I want to be a journalist. And so if I'm ever, <laughs> if I ever do anything important enough that um, they will want to go after me in similar ways, um, then I will actually have a way to like have money that I can send internationally, receive internationally. Like that's, that's amazing. I can have cash, but digitally, like that was, that was a very easy sell for me. Um, it was never about the price. It was never about anything else. It was just like, wow, I can control my money digitally. That is absolutely a great point. And I think that kind of defines a little bit the um, a lot of the earlier Bitcoiners uh, or people that came to Bitcoin, right? Like I can tell you for me, it was a lot of that, right? I had a situation where I was unbanked or I should say debanked 
And that was exactly one of those light bulb moments where it's like, I really do not actually own the the money that I've earned and that I've saved. And that kind of scared the hell out of me. So I really appreciate you explaining that. And it, it totally, it totally rings true. You know, like once you've so, experienced that, that, you know, that quality of Bitcoin becomes in my eyes, definitely like one of the most important besides the hard cap. Sorry, Walton, go ahead. I've been hearing about like, like different ways that people spend Bitcoin. Like many people, um, I think are using things like, you know, bit refill vouchers or the, the Bitcoin company mm -hmm. vouchers. Um, but there are also like other loopholes where people are buying gold coins because, because using gold coins as a medium of exchange then doesn't have like a tax liability or something. So there's like, there's, there's, there's various like other like off ramps that I like, I don't even realize like, like you learn about on like a, I don't know, a weekly basis where people are just doing kind of different things of how like, there are all these like hacks for on and off ramps. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, there was a, so I did a, a summer camp where I taught kids about Bitcoin last year. And one of the thought experiments I had them do, um, because we went to like the local area and there, um, there are often, you know, these shops where they're like, we sell Roman coins, blah, blah, blah. Um, I didn't buy any Roman coins, but I took a picture of the shop and I did this thought experiment with the kids where I asked them like, okay, so this, this Roman coin you see here, is this money? And most of them were like, no, cause Roman empire doesn't exist anymore. So no. There's no state backing it. Um, I said, okay, now imagine you are living during the Roman Empire. You're a man living during the Roman Empire. Is it money now? They're like, yeah, I guess it would be money then. It's like, okay, so now we have the time aspect. So money is very time dependent. Like what or what is money is very time dependent. And I told them, okay, you're still in the Roman Empire, but now you're a slave. Is this coin money? It's like, well, as a slave, you can't even own property. Um, you may... I, I mean, I, I would have to look at what the rules were about how slaves are able to use money, but most likely very restricted use of money if you even had any ever at all, most likely none. So is a Roman coin money to a person who literally can't use it, who can't own property? And so that was like, okay, now in, introduce time, the time aspect. Now, it also depends on the kind of person you are and the rights that you have in any given society. And this is what I talk about with people a lot who like they don't understand like why why do i use cash or why is cash important there are a lot of people still to this day in our modern society who cannot access a lot of the banking facilities that a lot of us have um for a number of reasons like they don't have the right documentation um they uh they live in a country where their name is uh not particularly let's say um, acceptable for that area. And so they get denied for that reason. Um, they get put on these stupid blacklist systems like world check, which is not mm -hmm. even any kind of scientifically based, um, or verified list, uh, most of the time in any way, a lot of the researchers who put people on the world check system, they, they have a quota of like how many people they have to create um, profiles about. It's like 60 per day or something crazy. Like this is adding 60 people per day. And on the and on that's on the basis of this person should be flagged for some kind of, you know, compliance reason that like banks should either not have them as a customer or they should do extra due diligence. Um, and a lot of the sources that they often use to find people to make profiles on are, you know, random sites like Reddit, or like not even like any kind of official reports, just random websites um, that are, you know, the degree of sourcing varies quite widely. And so you can do nothing wrong and you can end up on one of these databases and then you get blacklisted. And the worst part is often the banks can't tell you the reason, like you can get blacklisted and you'll have no mm -hmm. idea why, and it could be no fault of your own. And to me, that system is crazy. So I, I always tell people like, if, if and this is also why i care so much about like no kyc because like if whatever levels of kyc you have if one of these people um does not pass that then they are effectively they they are kicked out of the economy they can't participate in mm -hmm. in the economy anymore which in a society that relies very heavily on money the the exchange of money to be able to live, like that's a death sentence basically. 
Um, and I don't think a lot of the people in the compliance sector take this seriously enough um, at all. I mean, they think that they're doing serious good work, but actually the statistics um, like that have come out of like how effective compliance policies are um, show that like they're basically completely ineffectual. They're not stopping any crime whatsoever. Like the the the, the compliance policies have like an effectiveness rate that's less than like uh, like controlling the sale of illicit drugs. Like it's <laughs> it's terrible. Um, I think it's approximately one yeah. percent or something like that of of like yeah, not of even. The crime. Like I remember yeah. these KYC numbers were disgusting, and the amount of money that they spend on it on that infrastructure is insane. Talking about yeah. governments, right? Like the amount of money that yeah. they waste, you know, in the terms of a budget to, you know, to fund this KYC crap. But really, at the end of the day, it's all, in my eyes, it, it's all just about control. You know, it's just control yeah. and exclusion. Sorry, continue. Yeah. So you're effectively keeping, like, by some counts, billions of people, like, in poverty. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of them are stuck in poverty as a result of not having access to the same tools that a lot of uh, other people in other parts of the world do. You're keeping people in poverty. You're keeping people in dependent relationships where they often, especially women, have to rely on, for example, the male members of their family because either the laws in the country prevent them from having a bank account, even if it was possible to get one, mm -hmm. um, or just they would fail the compliance check. Um, and so then they have a dependency. Um, children also have a dependency because, because by nature of their age, often they're not allowed to have any kind of financial access. And if they do, it's all tied to their parents. Um, and so like, there's so many reasons why I think cashlessness is dangerous. And as much as I like Bitcoin, I don't think it's good enough to fill in all of the use cases that cash currently serves for the global population, especially the population that can't use anything else besides cash and then Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah. I think that this is where we get into the fact that Bitcoiners are, um, I, I find predominantly freedom of speech maximalists, right? It, it's like Bitcoin is currently the best tool in terms of, in terms of digital, um, best digital tool in terms of government, uh, in terms of censorship, right? But at the same time, to your point, um, even though cash is a government issued tool, it is still, it's still the best form of free speech money peer to peer. So it's an interesting point. I've noticed that a lot, that many Bitcoin supporters are also obviously huge proponents of cash, which brings me back to the freedom of speech maximalism. This is where I'm a fake Bitcoiner. I'm like, well, sorry, I'm going to have the like month free uh, on my interest on my credit card. Sorry. Like maybe I'm a peasant. Maybe I'm just like, you know, too early in this, in this journey. I don't know. Um, interesting <laughs> yeah i'm terrible but uh i don't know like i'd like i do i will spend cash uh in certain places um i don't know i feel like with big it it, it i was someone was talking to josie um i, I could never how to pronounce his last name the the, the, Baker. the core, that guy yeah the, and, he, and he was saying he's like a cash maxi and one one thing he likes about um europe over the united states is that you can actually buy flights with cash right so you can walk into amsterdam airport hand them a bunch of cash and buy it buy a plane ticket whereas you can't do that um in the in the united states or in 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 certain places um uh, but i do think uh, yeah cash is being kind of clamped down on like covid was a good time for people for them to try and argue that oh yeah cash is transmitting covid even though instead everyone's going to use contactless uh, payments on their on their credit card, but no one actually does it contactless, right? They were all actually touching mm -hmm. the thing. So actually, actually, it undermines their whole argument anyway. Even if you believe that stuff, um, but yeah, I think there is there is a war on cash, and it's yeah because because cash enables privacy and um, and, and and cash transactions aren't as taxable, right? Because you don't know if they're happening. They happen off chain, so to speak. That's right. Well I mean, you can, you can be, I mean, I think this is also a misconception. Like you can totally do everything in cash and still be compliant tax wise. Um, mm -hmm. Of course you can, of course but, you can. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I also wanted to mention since you brought up the COVID thing and ca uh, COVID transmission with cash, act, like 
I, uh, I think this is like under discussed, but like even the central bank, like the Bank of England and a bunch of other central banks actually put out reports saying this is all bullshit. Like they don't right. use the word bullshit, Correct. of course. But some but, of these, some of um, these places still have the barriers up, like you yeah, know, for for COVID or like one of the funnier things was they said they we can't ban cash actually because old people need to use cash, and it's like oh, I thought old people are the people at risk, and so like it's it's just like yeah they can't the, 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 there's clearly a campaign to do something. There's clearly a motion to do something because they have to keep switching the reason why why uh, this this movement seems to be happening. Yeah, the goalposts. The goalposts are moving, and and they'll never stop. Not the goalposts. It's just like the justification. Once one justification is like disproven, oh, we'll find yeah. another one. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, look, this is gonna it's gonna wrap up the uh, the fireside chat, and we are gonna move it on over to no. Walton has Before one we do, we need yeah. yeah, Janine. Where can people find out uh, more about? Uh, the the things that you you've talked about here on the on the show yeah I'm so sure i'm going to, uh, so um if you just search for that one privacy girl um i have a website that links to a bunch of the things that i've worked on um one of them is i used to do a newsletter called this month in bitcoin privacy and so that when i think i did that between 2020 and uh, october of last year um, where I was just reporting on what was happening regarding Bitcoin privacy and relevant news to that. Um, I would also recommend the resource privacyguides.org um, because, I mean, part of why that's so useful is because it gives you alternatives in a bunch of categories of things where if you're thinking like, oh, you know, I still need something to do like shared, um, you know, document editing or blah, blah, blah. How do I do that um, if I can't use Google? Um, there's a bunch of services that do very similar things to stuff that you already use, but the benefit is that they have better privacy policies and better privacy features than the the popular stuff. Um, so that's a really useful website because it kind of gives you reviews of different things and the uh, yeah alternatives. So how to um, not use Google products, etc. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, another another great book, um, Extreme Privacy by Michael Bazell. I mean, you might hear extreme privacy and think, well, I don't, I'm not even at beginner privacy, so why would I go to extreme privacy? But um, actually, the book is quite good because it has different categories, and there are a lot of things in the book which are not super complicated to do. I mean, the point of the book is for people who, I mean, the ti in the title, it's like how to disappear. Um, so it's for people who do want to go to the extreme, but there's also a lot of really simple stuff that you could implement some parts of it and it's not too hard to do and you would get a privacy benefit and you don't have to have this goal of like, I'm going to disappear from the face of the earth, uh, which in my opinion, that's for the most part, for most people, that's impossible to do these days, um, but it has a lot of good advice. Yeah. We're going to add that all to the uh, to the show notes. Thank you so much. I was going to ask you to do that at the end of the show as well. But anyways, yeah, it's good. Just do it twice. And uh, we're going to move it on over to Wrecked. Pleb Underground is brought to you by our newest sponsor, No Hue. Check them out at nohue.com. That's right, guys. The best Bitcoin builders in the space are coming together under one banner. Look for more people and more companies to be joining nohue.com proof of ink stack chain magazine btc pins asanoha gold crypto cloaks and btc sessions are all ready members go check out what's going on at nohue.com welcome back to wrecked where um my my bloodline has been doxed um a uh, friend of the show tarantula um um is 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 affectionately um um the like father of a, a, gr a group of a group of us uh and so um i was very disappointed this week when when his his father was was doxxed claiming claiming to be satoshi um um so here's here's tarantula's daddy to uh tell tell you about um tell you about uh uh his his invention that is bitcoin his name is uh Stephen Muller, um, and there is there is a little clip for you at some point. Wait, let me. Let me no, no, yeah. Mula. Do you not get the Whatever. joke? Mula, money. Mula. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here we have Satoshi himself. And I wrote it down, all of the posters. And 
I have evidences of all of that, but it's a, with a short time, I am here just to make the statements that yes, I am Satoshi Nakamoto, and this is my pseudonym. My legal name is Stephen Mola, and I created the Bitcoin and blockchain technology, which is working well, but I'm not happy with it. It's working well. Yes, it's working well because because Bitcoin has reached five continents within the five years and which I wrote it down. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, he's not ha he's not happy with how it's how it's working. Um, uh, but there was there was another clip that I I saw that I, that I don't have to hand that where he where um he talked about uh spending the Genesis block coins and like, yes. I feel like this is this is like a, such a rookie mistake. It's like if you're outside of Bitcoin, doesn't mean anything. Right? If you're Satoshi, you have all powers. You can probably spend anything. Right? But like if if you know anything about Bitcoin history, you know that that it's like hard coded that the 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 Genesis block uh block reward is is unspendable. Um uh yeah. So so this 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 little uh this this guy got wrecked pretty quick, like uh with with speaking loosely your thoughts. Um I, I just wanna quickly say he had a wallet dat file, not a wallet dot dat, which was pretty funny. He had, and you'll notice specifically, right, the screenshots, right, the the Genesis block. Article, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this is so ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so the other funny part of it, uh, the other funny part about the Genesis block, I think he believed that he could claim the um, the the Bitcoin that was sent to it, that he could he could spend that Bitcoin. So. This is just, I'm sorry. Uh, this is comical crap. Janine, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Yeah, when I heard about, I, I think I heard about this um, the day before that this was going to happen because there was a press release. And I just thought, oh, the Frontline Club, I really like them. What the hell are they doing? Um, so my favorite part of the commentary from that BBC correspondent who was there, I mean, he, I don't know, I was laughing I, when I read all of his tweets because he it was like he was clearly totally irritated <laughs> by what was going on and my favorite tweet was the one where he said uh that the frontline club actually interrupted the event to say please make very clear that we are not endorsing or affiliated with like this this event or this organizer and then he's like a reporter walked out <laughs> or something um yeah, I just uh, cause like so much, so much really impactful stuff has happened at Frontline Club. So I was like, how, how the hell did they get this, uh, get this in there? Um, yeah, it's like very rookie mistakes. Um, I there was another tweet where it was like, yeah, they couldn't get the computer working, so I guess they're gonna do this offline. It's like, how is Satoshi can't get his computer working? Are you kidding? Um, yeah, I just. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just so tired of all these fake Toshis. Um, the the hor most horrifying image I saw was someone spliced together this guy and CSW um, oh, make, making yeah, out. Yeah. It's like I think that was yellow. And, and they, they call it yellow. Fake, sounds like fake, a yellow, right? Yeah. Fake Toshi swap. I think they called it. <laughs> um. Yeah. Yeah. Yellow does these kind of things. I think it was a. I think it was. A, oh, there's like five of them. Um, but I think the one you're referencing is what's, what's also, also um, un, 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 un... is this it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> just, 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 just because like we we had to like see this horrible thing. Now you have to too. Wrecked. I I don't totally know if you wrecked. guys saw there. There was some court action. I don't know if it was today, but it was very recently. It might have been today. But I saw some tweets about it from the Bitmax research um, account about some CSW court stuff happening. And apparently he's now claiming that he can't come to court from his safe haven closet in Thailand because autism. And I thought, hmm, hmm, <laughs> all right then. <laughs> That's Phil's excuse, leave him alone. <laughs> Not a closet, Walton, a couch. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> it's a whole house, thank you. All right. <laughs> it's a whole house and a couch. There was yeah. there was this whole like commentary between him and the judge of like, yeah. well, why can't you come? Autism. And he's like, Autism. well, if you have issues, you can just like come a few days. There's daily flights between the UK and Thailand, so you can just come early. 
and <laughs> it just was not working. You, what, what hey, I apparently you've got experience in that CSW. All right, I'm done. Okay, but before okay, we before right, we move on, hold on. on Wait, uh, before the next story, before on. the next story, I just want to point out one last ridiculous inconsistency is that there was an announcement made the day before, and then he explains on the day of that he wasn't prepared uh, to prove that, that he was Satoshi and that he was just here to make the announcement. So again, it's just complete inconsistent nonsense. Sorry, Walton, continue. That's it. The other, the other, the, there is one more story on uh, yeah. on on Wrecked, and it's everyone who didn't come to TabConf. Because uh, and I'm and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a show and tell to to prove what why why you why why you got wrecked by not coming. All right. So the first one, big up TC. Check out this time chain calendar Genesis block T-shirt. Ah, oh, damn it! Proof of ink. Look at this beauty. Look at that. That's beauty. a good right. one. So, and that's a medium too. Yeah, gorgeous. All right. What else we got? We got a. Uh, I visited. Uh, shout out Stephen Delorn, ATL BitLab. Uh, that was cool. Thank you. Oh, they they cool. had some like big, they big panels, and we like drew on them. And I was like drawing math next in the Dav and stuff. It was fun. All right. Uh, next. Oh, and I, I I even did like they had a karaoke thing, and I did a. I killed it. It was fun. All right. Next. Shout out Santos. Uh, Tabconf uh, hackathon people. Uh, you, I don't know if you can see this shirt. Yeah, it's but tough it's to see that one, but it's cool. Pretty pretty cool. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Um, they were awesome. Uh, shout out Jay, the the Bit Devs creator and uh, the Bit Devs Socratic Village. Oh, that's Village, a cool one. Comp six. Yeah, that was a thanks to their sponsor. So thank you for that shirt. All right, good. Uh, up next. All right, yeah. Shout out uh, our guy Selly again, who gave me another another shirt. Bitcoin Rogue Money. Here you see proof of ink. Beautiful. Very nice. All right. Getting near the end of the week here. We have Saturday Saturday night. Um, Hoddle Ween, Ooh. right? A little special. Um, thanks to Charlotte Bitcoin. That was a good one. Uh, and then, like, just near the end of it, I'm hanging with uh, remember Hodling Eric, friend of the show? Absolutely. Um, yeah, him and his buddy, um, and uh, Gucci T. And I know Tommy can draw. And I, I had a I had a staff t shirt, right? That uh, that I that was mine. For, and I'm like, wait, I'm gonna get Tommy to draw on this thing. And 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 now I have like a, a beautiful one of one staff staff shirt here oh um, damn with some some like extra details here um i'll share the let me just share briefly you see the detail a little bit here yeah i i, I really like the mask and this and so then nice. he's like how do i what am i going to do with this hand up here and then he's like oh i do the the like hand of god this is yeah pretty pretty cool so uh yeah tab tab comp was was a, a big success uh, and you know how I like puns. One of the best puns um, at TabConf is is a side event uh, run on the Sunday just after the the thing. They have a cool T-shirt in in blue instead of black here uh, called Proof of Skate. Uh, it's a little skateboarding uh, thing on the last day. So yeah. Oh, and I and I got this uh, very limited edition hat uh, that I was I was wearing uh, all through the airport. So Tidwell, you're you're welcome for the free advertising. Okay, that's it. Thank you. That's wrecked. All of you people that didn't come to TabConf, uh, you are wrecked, uh, and I'll see you all of you next year. Everybody knows I'm a sucker for the swag, so I'm definitely, I'm definitely. Oh down wait, wait, no, way. sorry, I forgot. All right, show now, me more also, swag. I got, yeah. I got a build on Bitcoin hat from my boy, um, um, <laughs> uh, in 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 Thailand, right? Respect. Uh, what else? Stack Chain Magazine, some limited edition one, very nice. Nice. What's up, yellow? Uh, and a oh, sticker. Yeah, Is that a sticker there's a, there's in there? An article, a sticker? There's an article by Humble Warrior, uh, part of the the the, the, the family of a uh, club underground. There. What else did I get? Oh yeah. Um, this thing I can text people without without a SIM card. It connects to my mobile phone via Bluetooth, and, and I made mine so I can wear it as well. Yeah, put an Avento sticker on the front. Isn't that fun? So yeah, inside here, simple chip, couple of things. Apparently these are called mesh tastics. Uh, they're actually quite simple to build, even if you're not a techie. What else did I get? Oh yeah, there were also these like weird badges. Um, the, oh you could cool! Basically switch on, and then we could play like laser tag at each other. Anyway, that's it. All right, I'm done. TabConf was awesome. Uh, yeah, definitely showed me how down bad I am. All right, that that was a good one. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, we are gonna move it on over to the Hopium. The Hopium. Pleb Underground is brought to you by CypherSafe. Check them out at CypherSafe.io. Guys, you know that I am a pet rock enjoyer, and this is the 
Pet Rock for Bitcoiners. That's right, the Bitcoin Relo Triangle. 16 ounces of solid titanium. Check it out at cyphersafe.io and look for new products that are going to be coming out very soon at cyphersafe.io. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Hopium. I, I mean, if you thought for a second that, you know, we weren't going to show this, you're, you're very mistaken, uh, obviously, because it's it's Michael Saylor and he's everyone's favorite cheerleader. So here we go. MicroStrategy is raising. It's a tweet from Walker, a uh, fellow Bitcoiner, Walker America. MicroStrategy raising $42 billion to buy more Bitcoin. And there are still people out there who won't buy any because their financial advisor told them it was a Ponzi scheme once. Now, of course, this is, you know, great news for the uh, for the number for the NGU crowd that's always thrilled with that. But I got to say this, OK, this is where it gets a little weird. This is a tweet from Michael Saylor, same day. Um, join us tomorrow as we offer, right? This is on the 29th. Join us tomorrow as we offer the MSTR answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Now, I got to say, that to me, that that just sounds like a Ponzi scheme. That, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. And, sorry, and I know you probably I'm, didn't mean it that way. And, yeah. Unless I'm mistaken, yeah. Phil, um, some people... Um, believe well. That's a that's actually a quotation from um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? Yes. Forty two yes. is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And some people say that the reason Bitcoin is twenty one million is because half of forty two is twenty one. Um, so as in half of the answer to life, the universe, and everything is Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and the other half you have to work it out for yourself. I.e., the exercise is left to the reader. So I believe he is referencing that. Yeah. Nonetheless. Uh, Most people won't know that. Strategy is now the new socially acceptable shitcoin. Yeah. Um, apparently, uh, stonks. Woo. So, do we? I mean, I, I've thought about this quite a bit, right? Uh, in terms of how long he can continue this, and of course, right? It's it's all about it. Everybody looks at it just in terms of Bitcoin. Um, I don't know. Personally, I I don't know. Um. I, I tell people to I tell people to be careful, and I also tell people that there is a good possibility that a better company will come along and out micro strategy micro strategy. So, and in the end, all people are doing are is buying stocks. They're not. I know they think they're getting quote unquote exposure to Bitcoin, um, but you're just getting IOUs of IOUs. Anyways, anyways, to each their own. I get it, right? People want to love it. He's buying so much Bitcoin, he can do no wrong, no problem. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, on to some some great hopium here from from fellow Bitcoiner, friend to the show, Nifty Nye, right? I think Walton will appreciate this one. Uh, Nifty said this, this may be the cycle everyone gets everything they've ever wanted. Covenants on Bitcoin in brackets and stops talking to each other forever. So enjoy the debates while they last. That's right. You know why that's under hopium, right? I don't think the debates are ever going to stop, even if everyone gets everything they ever wanted. <laughs> I think it's wishful. But thinking. I appreciate I her optimism. Nifty, yeah. I think Nifty's trying to manifest something here. Yeah. Um, um, like very the positive. Wizards, Peter, like Reendal, like is convinced like Opcat's happening. You know, like next quarter sort of thing. Um, but I feel like the Covenants has sort of lost momentum since since austin like it, there was a bit through the summer like post the mm. bitcoin plus plus script edition where where covenants was all anyone was talking about in the bitcoin sphere in the, at least in the technical space um and, and now it's i don't know it feels it feels like it the it's it's kind of dried up this momentum and i think again it's in part due to this point i re keep referencing of the the lack of sustained fee pressure signals that the market doesn't require scaling solutions because there isn't demand for for block space so therefore uh we don't need uh other layers um to to have additional scaling solutions interesting janine what are your thoughts on this janine yeah the great scaling um, debate i I, uh, given how well I know the people in this space, I can't imagine that there will be anything that will get people to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're saying they're going to continue fighting. Oh yeah. 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 
Do, I... do you agree though that the like lack of sustained fee pressure kind of says that the market doesn't need scaling? I mean, I well, I don't know. I like at least in the spaces that I'm in, um, in the conversation, I don't see any like I don't know. There's the side of like what what is what are people paying attention to in terms of like marketing and conference talk, mm -hmm. and that may be slowing down. But I don't know the technical conversation still going on. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I was listening in on a space actually this week, Walton, to your point, right? Uh, I believe it was uh, Reardon, right? Reardon Code was uh, was hosting it. Shinobi was in there. Alex B was in there, right? It was a whole bunch of them all talking about Opcat and essentially... Oh, you're muted. Reardon was one of few people that I'm now thinking wasn't at TabConf, like of from the kind of Bitcoin developers. There were a lot of Bitcoin developers there, right? Hmm. And and yeah, they they were having essentially this you know this conversation about Opcat and essentially uh, Reardon was trying to figure out um, how to essentially push um, push Opcat into the the meme plex right, making it like a essentially trying to figure out a way to create a powerful enough meme that will draw enough people in, which I think is interesting. So to Janine's point, right, I, I don't think the discussions are ever going to stop, even if everybody gets what they want. But going back to Walton's point about the the fee pressure, you know, this kind of reminds me again um, of like a, a, um, a Bcash light. Right, like this. This kind of reminds me of uh, of like uh, of 2017 and that whole time, but the light version of it. Right, because we've already had the fork and the fork failed, you know. And then we had BSV, and of course, we all know the story behind that. So it's just like now we're sitting here looking at this, and and people are trying to drum up this this whole thing that we need to make changes now. And I'm not saying you know ossify Bitcoin or anything like that, but what I am saying is is that. I, I always get very weary of a um, an increased need for immediate action when I I just don't see the conditions for it. But again, I'm also not necessarily that knowledgeable. Maybe I'm missing something. Like I'm not saying we shouldn't be working on scaling solutions, but I don't necessarily I I don't think that we should be pushing them as hard because right now this is still the beginning. I. To me, the point is we know. should we should build them before we need them because otherwise yeah they're not we should build them we before need. we need them and then if and then if when you need them they're not there then 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 there might be then some time period after where like I feel like there's already been a time when we needed them like I feel like the when when fees spiked to I don't know into the like hundreds maybe like there's there's a call that maybe you need you some need of these them. things sometimes. But it's that that fee pressure is not sustained. We then drop back down to single digit sats per vbyte. Then it's not that we need scaling. It's that people aren't are being too high time preference with, with with their on chain. But then all that happens is that people find other ways to kind of batch transactions on different layers. Whether that's like in the kind of in the real world, like you know you can. Or, or, or like on lightning or like between different like there's different kind of way we've talked about this before different ways that you can kind of scale bitcoin for yourself that leaves a smaller footprint on chain but it's not in a trustless way mm. you know or not in a trust minimized way right these are often like ways where you know often you're having to trust custodians more um e even if it's for a uh you know not an especially long period of time and even if you can do quick withdrawals from the custodians you, there's there's still right now people are scaling ad hoc using uh, yeah a, a bundle of more custodial solutions than i would prefer hmm. yeah any thoughts on this uh, janine before we wrap up summer of 69k <laughs> <laughs> We're still sitting there, huh? We're still sitting there. The best time of our lives. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, this is going to wrap up the uh, this episode of Pleb Underground Weekly Show. Janine, one last time. If the viewers want to find you, if they want to take a look at all the stuff that you've done, uh, where where can they find this info? And again, it's all going to be in the show notes. 
Yeah, just search for that one, Privacy Girl. Um, on Twitter, I'm J9Rom, R-O-E-M. Um, been quite quiet these days, but maybe I'll have something coming up soon. <laughs> very cool, very cool. We really appreciate you joining us on the show. Guys, don't forget to check us out on our audio-only platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor. If you want to stream a sats, check us out on fountain.fm. Walton, it's awesome to have you back. How do we end this, man? And you're muted. I'm I'm I was muted, my bad. <laughs> All right, fuckshitcoins.com. Please like and subscribe. We'll see you next week. Peace. More toxic, what? More toxic than the most toxic pick on Maxi ever. They said he's more